Welcome back to Revival Radio TV. I'm your host, Gene Bailey. Today is a day I've been waiting for because we're going to dive right into a revival that has happened recently. Some of you remember what had happened. You may have heard rumors about stuff going on in North Georgia. Well, today, Pastor Todd Smith. Pastor, thank you for joining today. Now, I want to go very slow. I want everybody to understand what the process of what happened there at your church in Dawsonville, Georgia, which is about an hour north of Atlanta, right? Yep. Okay. Uh, So let's kind of walk through. First off, give us a little history of yourself. Like you went to school here in Fort Worth. I did. I went to Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary, uh, left there, pastored a Southern Baptist church in the North Georgia area. Uh, Four and a half years into that, I got hungry for more of God, started reading the scriptures without my um, my theological lenses on, you know what I'm saying, my Baptist So did something glasses. push you to that point or yeah. you just, it was just came naturally? I just started, I, literally, I just started reading the Bible and saying, why, why aren't we seeing things in my church that they experienced in the book of Acts? That really was the starting point. And and I said, Lord, I'm taking off my Baptist lenses. I'm going to read the Bible as, as, as if I just got saved. And that's when it became uh, real to me that there was more of God. And shortly thereafter, I experienced the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and everything changed. So take walk us through that. What happened when you got baptized in the Holy Spirit? Because this is yeah, this is a big deal. It's a huge deal. I mean, it's a big deal that it happened, but it's a big deal that uh, Southern Baptist pastor, I mean, that's going to that's gonna change a lot of things at your church. Oh, it, it did. And, and I was pastoring one of the fastest growing Southern Baptist churches in the state right. of Georgia at that time. And, and so I, I just got so hungry and thirsty for the supernatural, but not just the supernatural, just more of Jesus. Just saying, Lord, I want to see what you did in the book of Acts and the gospels manifest in my church. And so it culminated in a a prayer meeting that I went to. I went to a Pentecostal prayer meeting, and that's the last place that a Southern Baptist pastor should be. And it was at that point that they laid their hands on me, and everything, Gene, that I had ever preached against, in fact, I even mocked speaking in tongues. I forbade it at my church. I said, stay away from these crazy people, you know, these charismatics. But everything that I preached against happened to me in that moment. And my life forever changed. I remember falling back in the Holy Spirit and speaking in tongues, thinking in my natural mind, my wife's going to kill me and my deacons are going to fire me. That's what I was thinking. And uh, my wife didn't kill me, but I ended up getting dismissed from my church. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I'm sorry to hear that. Yeah. All right. So that was when? Let's get a little... That was 1995. 1995. Yes. So I've been walking in the things of the Spirit since 1995. All right. So walk us through what happened next. So you've been released from your uh, pastorate Mm -hmm. there. And so what did you do next? I planted a church and um, people came from all over Georgia to be filled with the Holy Spirit because they thought, okay, here's a pastor that has an education and he has a reputation. The Lord is using him and they came from everywhere to be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So we planted multiple churches throughout the North Georgia area uh, with the emphasis on the power of the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Did you ever wonder that maybe you had snapped and gone over the deep end or did the wrong thing or maybe this wasn't real? Did you ever have doubts? Not really because the the impact of the Holy Spirit was so, it was like night and day to me. Uh, I, I love the Lord, but when I got baptized with the Holy Spirit, I fell in love with Him. And the scriptures just literally would leap off the page. And I, I've read that a thousand times, but now it was just like rhema to me. And yeah, so I never doubted, did I do the right thing? Uh, I, it's, it's just been that life-changing for me. So let's go back to that night in 1995. So you came home. What did your wife say? Well, you know, she was independent fundamental Baptist. I was Southern Baptist. And if you've never lived with an independent fundamental Baptist, and I love them, you know, they're against everything. I mean, they really are. And the first thing that she said to me when I walked into the house after that encounter with the Holy Spirit, she said, well, did you get it? And I said, get what? Well, you know, did you get what you went after? And I said, I think so. And, and so I remember, Gene, this is so funny. I would be in my master bedroom closet praying in tongues, and I would hear her pattering of her feet sneaking up to the master bedroom closet door to hear me pray in the Holy Ghost. Right. And eventually 
she opened up. And it took her nine months because she was so indoctrinated that tongues is of the devil, that this is not for today. It has passed on. And, and nine months later, she got baptized with the Holy Spirit, spoke in tongues for 45 minutes. And that girl has never been the same either. I, I really want to kind of drill down a little bit. Um, and again, we're not saying anything negative against Southern Baptists at all. But how do you, how did you adjust? I know the power of the Holy Spirit came, you spoke in tongues. How did your, all your training, all your teaching, all your preaching was in that vein? Mm -hmm. So now you've got a light has come on. Um, how did you, how did you handle all that? How'd you handle that shift? Uh, very carefully. I, I still honor my heritage. Sure. Um, I learned a great deal. In fact, I was saved as a result of a Baptist Thank girl you. inviting me to church. And I was saved in First Baptist Church, Pleasant Grove, Alabama. So my heritage means a lot to me. So I'm very careful not to over-criticize, but I can I can critique because I'm one of them. I still claim to be Baptist. I'm charismatic. I'm Pentecostal, all of that. So about 90% of what I learned was great. Yeah. Uh, it was the additional 10% that really sent me over the edge in a beautiful way of saying it opens up the kingdom of God, the power of the Holy Spirit, the supernatural signs and wonders, believing God for the now of the kingdom to be in full expression. So it was like a, a child at a, at a candy store that when I entered into the baptism of the Holy Spirit, I go, all of this is available. The gifts of the Spirit are still in operation today because I was under the uh, impression of sensationism that, you know, at the death of the last apostle, the gifts were no longer available. So I, it was like a whole new arena opened up to me. And so I just ran with it. And people loved it because they're thinking, all my life, this has been available. Right. And I didn't know it, but yeah. now I do. All right. Mm -hmm. All right. So, so let's dive. See, the point I want to make there, and you said it perfectly, is you said 90%. It was great. We cannot throw out uh, it takes the whole body. I know our, our founder, Kenneth Copeland, said, and I like to quote this just a few years ago, he said, uh, it's time for the streams of ministry to come together and that we have to understand we all have a part to play. This is part of the body. We all have a place. So, and I'm glad we, that's exactly what you said because it's real easy to get off and talk about bad about this and about that and you'll miss the whole point. Mm -hmm. You'll miss it. So thank you for that. So now as we, let's pick up the story your your wife is now baptized baptized in the Holy Spirit. She's experienced the baptism, and now what? Walk us through what happened next. Well, we we just planted a new church. It exploded. Then we started planting churches all throughout North Georgia, and uh, built new buildings. You know, acquired new campuses, and God just really um, highlighted the power of the Holy Spirit. So a lot of people were filled and baptized, but. Uh, to where we are right now, in 2010, I took over a church that had some problems. And that, um, I came out of the church that I planted, and then this church said, hey, can you help us transition through these difficult days? I said, absolutely, I'd love to. So I, I became their pastor. But four or five years into that, Gene, I'm dying as a pastor. My church is diminishing. It's plateaued. Um, you know, the crisis that they went through was having its toil and effect. And I thought I could revive it and I thought I could save it. And it was, it was like air leaving a balloon, right. people leaving our church. Then we stabilized in, as a very small church. Um, we're in a 140,000 square foot building. And you can imagine having 150 people in a sanctuary that seats 1,200 people. Right. Right. Uh, so the devil played with my emotions. Sure. Your failure, if you were a better communicator, if you were a stronger leader, God would use you. You need to leave. You're destroying this place. And it was in that context, Gene, that um, the Lord led me to Psalm 27, verse 8, where the Bible says, God, when you said, seek my face, my heart said to you, your face will I seek. And it reminded me, and I looked at that, and, it, and David had lost the face of God. Mm. God had to remind David, the most powerful man on the planet, the strongest, you know, military on the planet. He said, David, you've lost my face. Would you seek it again? And it dawned on me, Gene, at that moment, 
in 2018, I had lost the face of God. I was acquainted with his hand, his promises, his blessings. We were having good church, but I thought if I have lost the face of God, how many people in my congregation do? Break, break that down a little deeper. What does that mean, you'd lost the face of God? Well, it, when I would come and I pray to him, it was basically, I would ask him for things, good things. And it's not wrong to ask. We, we're, we're encouraged to ask. But it was always like I had a list. Here's my needs. Here's what I'd like for you to do for me. And, and so I was acquainted with the hand of God. Mm-hmm. And, and we know as parents, if our kids always come to us and they just want something from us, asking us for things, but never sit down and talk to us and say, hey, I just want to let you know you're the greatest parent in the world. You know, that type of thing. And, and just wanting to, hey, how's your day doing? When our children do that, it opens up our heart sure. to them, to bless them, to pour out to them unexpected things. And so when I lost the face of God, I did it in the midst of ministry, in the midst of being a parent, being a husband, uh, being a counselor. And I realized, God, I ha- I've gone after your hand, but from this point on, I'm not going to ask you for anything for this season. And all I'm going to do is pursue your face. Whatever you want, that's what I want. And so at that moment, Gene, I called our church to a 21 day fast. And we said, we're going to do three things. We're going to seek three things. We're not going to ask God for anything personally. We're going to seek his face. We're going to cry out for his glory. And then thirdly, we're going to say, God, anything in us that grieves you, that offends you, I want you to reveal it to me and to us, and we'll repent of it. So for 21 days without food, just water and juices, our church sought the face of God, cried out for his glory, and got real and said, Lord, anything, my entertainment choices, my attitudes, the unforgiveness in my heart, anything that grieves you, would you reveal it? And for 21 days, that's what we did. And two weeks into that pursuit, Mm. I'm walking across our platform and I see my baptistry empty, no water in it. But for eight seconds, I saw it full of water and a strip of fire on it. Now, I'm Baptist. We don't have visions. <laughs> right. You know, if we're, right. if we're fasting and we have a vision, it's of a hamburger or something. Sure. You know, it, it's, okay. not of, it's not supernatural. But I saw the first vision I ever saw in my life. Mm. My baptismal pool, empty, full of water, with a strip of fire on it, two and a half to three feet wide from front to back. Now, this is... And what year was this? This is 2018. 2018. 2018. I see this as, as, as it is as real to me as I'm looking at you right now. And this now. is in the middle of your, your message? No, in the middle of a time of prayer oh, and fasting. Prayer. Yeah, okay. I'm fasting and I'm praying. I'm walking across our platform and I see that baptismal pool. Wow. And I hear the Spirit of the Lord say to me, Todd, I'm going to baptize people with Holy Spirit and fire. Mm. Had no idea what it meant. Now, as a good Baptist, I thought my new converts were going to have an incredible time in the water that they'll never backslide. And two weeks later, Gene, two weeks later, the glory of God falls in our sanctuary. Literally, the weight, the kibbutz of God enters our sanctuary. And ever since that moment, we've been in revival and baptized over 33,000 people from literally all over the world. And they're encountering the Holy Spirit fire in their immersion. Absolutely remarkable. Yeah. So one point here that I want to bring out, it was from 95 to 2018. That's what, 22 years, 23 years? Mm -hmm. It's a a long time that that, uh, before you saw something. Mm -hmm. So when people wonder, before we pick up the story, when people wonder if this is real, uh, I want you to tell me what happened when you saw that and you thought, wait a minute, what am I seeing? Basically, I've never had a vision before. What went through your mind at that point? Again, I'm thinking my new converts are going to have an incredible experience okay. because I understand baptism as a Baptist. It is a, it is a symbolic expression sure is. of their new commitment to Jesus. And it's a public display, like putting on the wedding ring. And that's what I thought. But when the glory of God sat down in the room, we started spontaneously baptizing people the following Sunday. 
So it didn't happen that night. Mm -mm. It was the next Sunday. Yeah. Okay. And so we, we said, if you're backslidden away from God and you want to renew your commitment to Jesus, come to the water right. and, and just be immersed again. And not nullifying their first immersion as their new, new birth immersion, but this is just like coming to the altar a second time, third time. Just come and just say, hey, I'm distant, I'm away from God, and I need, I need to make a public display of that. Well, all of a sudden, a man gets into the water to assist his mother getting baptized. He asked me, he said, that's my mom getting baptized. Can I walk in the water and help her? I go, sure. He walks in with psoriasis all over his body, up and down his arms and on his legs. And while he's there, he says, can I get baptized? They said, sure. They baptize him. He walks out of the water and he looks at his arms and the psoriasis had melted off of his body, off of his legs, off of his arms. And he said, Todd, look at my arms. It, it, at that moment, it dawned on me that what God showed me with these baptismal waters was more than just a... Um, New birth, yeah, 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 but it was an encounter where God is going to meet his children in multiple ways through multiple expressions. We've seen people with drug addictions literally feel the drugs leave their body, come through the pores of their body as they're being immersed and coming up out of the water. Multitudes of people, as soon as they're baptized in the Holy Spirit and fire in that water, come up speaking in tongues. Mm -hmm. We've watched blind eyes open, deaf ears open, legs grow, medically verified, because that's what we love to do. We love to get things medically verified. Show me your condition before. Show me the x-ray before. Now let's look at what's happening in your body today. So let's go back to the gentleman's psoriasis on his arms. When he showed you his arm, what, you know, obviously you're excited about this. Did, is, is that what happened with the congregation? Did you talk to them, show them? Yeah, all of a sudden it, it exploded. Right. Now there's this small little church in North Georgia barely trying to make it. Then word begins to spread through our region. Hey, there's this little town called Dawsonville, Georgia in the foothills of the Appalachians. God's meeting people in the water. And the beautiful thing, Gene, about this move of the Spirit, it's not personality driven, okay? It's nameless and faceless. And I think, Gene, what's happening in America right now, God is, God's going to move in this country in a powerful way. There's going to be revival, but he's going to find some people that don't want any of the accolades that don't want any of the glory. They simply want Jesus to be able to do what Jesus does. And so it's nameless and faceless. After 33,000 baptisms, it's still, glory to God, nameless and faceless. God gets all the credit. He's the one. Three seconds in the water changes everything for people. Yes, and we're going to talk uh, next week. We're going to kind of dive into some of the uh, actual miracles that happen. But let's let's pick up the story um, where that ha that miracle happened. So did suddenly you said it kind of the word spread. Obviously now you you got more people coming to your church, right? Oh, absolutely. Not only coming to the church, but coming to the Sunday night service because we do the immersions on Sunday, Sunday night. night. My Sunday morning service stayed the same, but on Sunday night, people from everywhere, from all over the country were, were coming. And now, Gene, this will blow your mind. People would get there at four in the afternoon Doors would open at 4.45 for a time of prayer for one hour. And then when we would have the worship and the preaching, we would say, hey, if you want to be immersed tonight, if you want to experience God in the water to be baptized in the Holy Spirit fire, get in line. People were getting in line 250 to 300 people deep. We were baptizing to six in the morning. People were waiting 14 hours to encounter Jesus in the water. Now imagine that, you'll get at church at four in the afternoon, but you're waiting all through the night, many cases with children, sleeping on our chairs and on the floor, but at 5.35, 5.45 in the morning, getting into the water and that fire of the Lord touching you and the wait was absolutely worth it. Yeah, yeah. I, I can, boy. Mm. It's exciting just hearing you talk about it. Well, that was 2018, and things have it has grown. Has there been any ebb to what, uh, what God's doing in the water there? Absolutely. In fact, it's intensifying. Intensifying. It's not, it, it is not letting up. 
Um, and here's the reason why, Gene. Our church, I understand, I understand as a pastor, my number one responsibility in this revival, and even as the pastor and leader of my church, is, is not to preach. See, I was trained that if I preached and if I discipled people well and won the lost, right. And if I married well, buried people well, did all the church pastoral things well, my church would grow, and it did. But I have come to understand, and people may disagree with this, but I I believe it to be accurate. The number one role of a man of God, woman of God, pastor, is not to preach. It's not to make disciples, win the lost. My number one role is to host the presence of God. Yeah, amen. Okay? Now, with that, people go, what does that look like? Well, creating a culture in my own heart and in my own walk with Him that God is attracted to, that I'm, I'm quick to repent. I remain in a broken and contrite state with Him because He says, I, I am, He says, this one thing I look for. He, this is what He said in Isaiah. This is the one thing I look for, a man or woman who has a broken and contrite spirit. And he says, I will revive that individual. So I have to create that culture in my spirit and in my life. And then my my top priority is to create that same culture in my church. To host the presence of God so that there's nothing that he has to walk over, step over. My tradition, my sin, my unforgiveness, my bitterness. But literally as John the Baptist clear the way, so that God can come and bring kingdom to our church at any moment. And my quest is to help pastors on how to do that. What does that look like? What What does that pathway look like on hosting the presence of God? It's not easy. It's not easy. It's it's arduous, very difficult. But when a pastor understands that, to host him, kingdom comes. Wow, so good. Well, I think right now we, I need to let you talk to the people that are listening and uh, they, they're going to this baptism of the Holy Spirit. I've heard it in a different way and uh, there are doors that are open just because of you sharing that testimony. So I want you to lead the people. Look at that camera and yeah. pray, lead, whatever you need to do and help people receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Well, I want you to know that the baptism of the Holy Spirit is for you. It's not just for a select group. So if you're born again, the baptism of the Holy Spirit is yours. God wants you to have and encounter this, but there's several things that are going to happen. I'm going to pray for you. And at the moment of me praying for you, I'm going to say, be filled with the Holy Spirit. At that moment, the Holy Spirit's going to come upon you. But then you're going to begin to speak in other tongues. You're going to begin to pray in the Holy Ghost. Now, I want to say this. Praying in the Holy Spirit is for every born again individual. Do you know that Mary, the mother of Jesus, spoke in tongues. The Bible says in Acts 1.14 that she was among the group in the upper room. And in Acts 2, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. Every disciple Jesus had spoke in tongues. The writer of two-thirds of the New Testament spoke in tongues. And he says, I wish you all spoke in tongues. So here's what's going to happen. You're going to connect your tongue to your spirit. All of your life you've been praying from your tongue to your head and turn your head and out of your mouth. Paul says, when I pray in tongues, my spirit prays. So you're going to connect that to your spirit. And I'm going to pray that the Holy Spirit falls upon you. And at the moment when I give that command of faith, out of your belly, begin to speak no longer in English, no longer in English, but that spirit language, which is going to come forth. So Father, I thank you that right now, that people all over the world are going to experience the power of the Holy Spirit like I did when they laid their finger on me, on my forehead. The very same encounter is coming upon you right now. Say these words. Say, Jesus, here I am. I ask you to cleanse my heart. Forgive me of my sin. And I'm ready for everything that you have. I ask you for the infilling of the Holy Spirit. I ask you to baptize me now with your power. I receive everything that you have for me. By faith, I will be filled and speak in new tongues in Jesus' name. Now, as the Holy Spirit is falling upon you, 
It's not an emotion. It's not a feeling, but by faith. When I give this command, be filled, I want you to begin openly speaking in your prayer language. Don't hesitate. Don't delay. He's coming right now. It's already, bell- it's already swelling up on the inside of you. You feel it. Thank you, Lord. Thank you that you're doing this. Thank you that you're doing this. All over the world, thousands upon thousands of people are being filled with the Holy Spirit right now. One, two, three, be filled with the Holy Spirit. Be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Now, out of your belly, begin to release that. Begin to speak it. Connect your tongue to your spirit, man. Don't worry about what it sounds like. It may be just one syllable. Speak it right now. Lord, give them more. Give them more. Fire of the Holy Ghost come upon them right now in Jesus' name. Don't stop. Keep going. Keep going. Yes, Lord. Thank you. Thank you, Lord Jesus. There's someone right now driving down the the road. You're speaking in tongues for the very first time. Keep going. Don't worry about what it sounds like. You have to pull over on the side of the road. Release this supernatural ability to communicate with God, the perfect will of God. Every time that you pray in tongues, you pray the perfect will of God. Amen. Praise God. Amen. 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 And I want to say, there are those that you feel like you need a little more help and you want someone to pray with you. The great thing is you need to be able to testify. Talk about what God's done. Call the number right there on your screen, 817-291-6297. Let someone, there's a qualified prayer minister on the other end to pray with you. We want to send you some free material, absolutely free, help you in your walk, understanding what just happened. Uh, So call the number or you can go to the website for more information. We are here for you and that's why you're there. So thank you, Pastor Todd. We're going to pick this story up next week. But before we go any further, I want to mention his books. Now, I have not read this one, but I started reading God's Glory. And this is what happened. I heard about the revival. And I'm and I got um, your publisher, Destiny Image, actually sent me this book. And I started reading and I called Gary and said, let's get, I want him. I want him uh, on the program. So thank you. How can people get more information about your books? Well, they can go to kingdomready.tv, kingdomready.tv, get it there or from Amazon and they're available at Amazon. Yeah. So do that and stay with us next week. Part two, we're going to talk about some of the miracles and how to be in that secret place. Thanks for watching. See you next week.